Welcome back. Well, we're finally going to learn some science. This part of this series is difficult for me because as an adult, I've read a lot more theology than I have natural science. The knowledge I have of the dating methods that scientists use to date the Earth and the universe, I have entirely from uh, popular level books, which you can read as well as I can. I'm gonna suggest three to you to help you. Um, my knowledge is not profound. I hope if I make mistakes, those of you with better knowledge will let me know and allow me to correct my mistakes. I'm doing the best I can. A good place to start if you want some general information about how, to, how scientists think about the age of the Earth is a book by Alan Hayward called Creation and Evolution, Rethinking the Evidence from Science and the Bible. This was published back in the 1980s, so it's a bit old. Uh, Dr. Hayward is no longer with us. Dr. Hayward actually belonged to a group that denied the trinity of, of, of God, so that they were a little bit, he was a little bit off of Orthodox Christianity. Nevertheless, I think this book is very, very good and is the easiest book I know as a starting place for understanding why scientists believe that the earth is very, very, very old. So I would encourage you to take a look at this book, Creation and Evolution, and it's, it's of interest that he was opposed to evolution. He was obviously not creating reasons for evolution. As Dr. MacArthur has said that geologists and uh, astrophysicists do. On the contrary, he did not believe in Darwinian evolution, but he thought that the evidence for the age of the Earth was beyond any sort of uh, critique. Another book that's very helpful, a more recent book, is Davis Young and Ralph Sturley, The Bible Rocks in Time, Geological Evidence for the Age of the Earth. This focuses entirely upon geology and on Theology. They take a look, these are both evangelical Christian uh, geologists, they take a look at the Bible, they look at the history of the controversy, and they look at the geology, and they go into a lot of depth and a lot of detail. It's a thick book, it's a little more challenging, but well written, not difficult to read, and if you read this you'll understand really well why geologists think as they think. Another book that I have found very helpful for just summarizing not only geological evidence, but also evidence from uh, the, the universe about the age of things is G. Brent, Brent Dalrymple, Ancient Earth, Ancient Skies, The Age of Earth and Its Cosmic Surroundings. Uh, this book is small. Um, it's not too difficult. I, I find that the sections on radiometric dating a little bit hard. That is to say, my, my science is not so strong that I can just skim through these and, and grasp the concepts very quickly, but it's not that difficult either. And those of you with better scientific background than I have will find no problem with it whatsoever. And it's very well written. These three books can give you a lot of help. Let me make a suggestion to you as we begin this. Those of you who may be coming from a young earth perspective, I would encourage not to jump too hastily as you hear me talk about age for the, as evidence for the age of the earth. Do not jump too hastily to say, well, wait a minute, don't the young earth scientists have a refutation of that? I can tell you in advance they do. The young earth scientists have a refutation for just about everything I'm going to say. That is, they have an alternative explanation for everything that I'm going to talk about. But remember the principle. You want to understand the other person's perspective before you critique it. And what we need to do right now is, as much as we can, just sort of soak in the ways of thinking of mainstream geologists and then astronomers to understand how and why they see the world as they do. I'm going to start with geology and I'm going to start with the evidence from the sedimentary rocks. Um, when geology got its start in the 18th century, the geologic column, that is to say the, the, the stack of rocks, of sedimentary rocks that can be seen all around the world, not the same all around the world, but nevertheless there is this kind of stack all around the world, was one of the first things that caused the early geologists to conclude that the earth must be very, very old. Now they were working in Europe. I know nothing about European geology. I know very little about American geology, but I know a little bit about one section of the American Southwest. So let me use that simply because that's what I know the most about. I wanna talk for a few minutes about the Colorado Plateau, which is a section that uh, encompasses part of four states in the United States. And I wanna talk about the, the, the phenomenon in the Colorado Plateau that's known as the Grand Staircase. I'm going to show you a graphic in a few minutes of the Grand Staircase. I've not been able to find a really good one in the public domain that I can use without concern about 
uh, copyright infringement. But I'll show you what I have. But if you go online to Google and simply look for Colorado Plateau Grand Staircase graphics or something like that, you will find really good graphics that help you see very clearly what I'm going to be talking to you about. The, the lowest part of the uh, Colorado Plateau is the Grand Canyon. If you go to the Grand Canyon and look down into it or hike down into it, what do you see? Well, you see about a mile's worth of rock stacked upon one another, layers upon layers, strata upon strata of rocks that are uh, primarily, they're all of um, sedimentary nature. Now, at the very bottom, you have rocks that are not. You have rocks that are igneous rocks, that is, they are uh, from the, the cooling of molten rock, magma, or they are metamorphic rocks, rocks that have been changed by pressure and heat deep in the earth. But most of what you see in the Grand Canyon are sedimentary rocks. That means that they are rocks that were, were laid down either under water or by wind. And what you see is very distinct groups of rocks. That is, there are different colors. That's what makes the Grand Canyon so beautiful. There are different hardnesses. There are different compositions to these rocks. And taking it all together, there are thousands upon thousands of strata of rocks comprising the Grand Canyon. And the Colorado River has cut down through this, enabling us to see all of these strata. It's a wonder, wonder, wonderful phenomenon for us that we can see all of this. And these rocks appear to have been laid down at different times. Why would I say that? Because, first of all, there are rocks of different, different compositions, different hardnesses, differing colors, uh, which depends upon the chemical composition, also upon the availability or lack of availability of oxygen at the time that these rocks were being formed. There are differences in the ways in which they were laid down. Most of these were laid down underwater, and therefore the layers are uh, parallel to the ground, that is they're horizontal and parallel to one another like this. But there's at least one formation of rock in the Grand Canyon, the Coconino sandstone, that appears to have been laid down by, by wind. That is, it appears that these are ancient sand dunes that have become lithified, turned to stone. And the reason for saying that these appear to be uh, sand dunes is that the, 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 the formation of the rock, the, the, the orientation of the particles of, or grains of sand that make up these rocks that are cemented together, instead of being horizontal lines like this, uh, sometimes the lines go like this, and sometimes they go like this. And, and the very same thing can be seen in sand dunes today, for example, in the Sahara Desert, where the wind will blow the sand up one side of a dune, and then some of it comes over the other top, of, over the other side, then the wind will change from another direction and blow the wind this way. And we'll talk about this also in regard to Zion National Park and the Navajo Sandstone, which is of the same nature. So you have in the Grand Canyon these various layers of rock, strata of rock, mostly water-deposited sedimentary rock, but of different, different types. And then you have also this wind-deposited sandstone, the Coconino Sandstone, and then on top of that, more water-deposited rocks. And this goes on for about a mile. It looks very much as if uh, this has been going on for a long time. That is, as if these rocks were laid down, deposited by water or by wind over very long periods of time and uh, with differing conditions. Now, suppose that you leave the Grand Canyon and you move a little bit to the west, uh, or to the east rather, and to the north. You come to Zion Canyon, Zion National Park. What's interesting about Zion is this. There are, again, many types of stone that are visible in the canyon there. But the, the stone that is the lowest stone, the lowest formation that you can see in Zion Canyon, is the same as the highest formation you can see at the Grand Canyon. So in other words, here's the Grand Canyon, and the top layer is right here, and the rest of the canyon is like this. Zion begins here and goes like this. This is why we call this the Grand Staircase. Zion is the second step in the staircase. So the lowest formation in Zion Canyon is the same as the top formation in the Grand Canyon. And then you have on top of this many layers in Zion Canyon of, again, water deposited shale or mudstone or sandstone. And then these huge cliffs, known as Navajo sandstone, very hard sandstone, that again appear to be ancient sand dunes. Geologists believe that there was at one time a, a desert in this area, similar, very similar to the Sahara, with huge sand dunes. Over time, these were cemented together chemically, they became lithified, they became rock. And then on top of the Navajo sandstone, 
you have more water deposited layers of sediment, sedimentary rock. Okay, so Grand Canyon, then Zion. Go a little bit further to the east and to the north and you come to Bryce Canyon. Bryce Canyon is one of the most beautiful places in the, in the world, I believe. Uh, Bryce Canyon is, consists of these wonderful, uh, these wonderful hoodoos, these, these, these stone, um, uh, what should we call them, formations that are the result of the various layers of sand or, or of, of rocks that are in the canyon gradually eroding. And of great interest, the lowest formation at Bryce Canyon is the same as the highest formation at Zion Canyon. So Grand Canyon, bottom of the staircase, Zion takes you up a step, then you move on to Bryce, that takes you up a further step. The formations in Bryce Canyon are beautiful because they are multicolored and because the, the stones are of different hardnesses. Uh, you see, for example, places where it looks like somebody's taken a big rock and put it on top of a very small pedestal. That's because the underlying rock is softer than the overlying rock. But in fact, these were deposited one on top of the other. And there is sandstone and there is also limestone, very different materials that appear to have been laid down in succession over a period of time as that area was covered by lakes, by, ri by rivers, and so forth. So, taking this staircase as a whole, what do we have? Well, we have about a mile of Grand Canyon, and then if we add to that Zion Canyon and Bryce Canyon, it's another um, mile, more than a mile. The total is about 11,000 feet from the top of Bryce Canyon down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. About 11,000 feet of sedimentary rock, of which at least two portions I know of, geologists believe to be wind-deposited sandstone, not water-deposited sandstone. Well, it gets even more complicated than that. What's at the bottom? At the bottom of the Crane Canyon, you have, as I mentioned before, igneous rock and metamorphic rock. But interestingly, if you go further east, still in the Colorado Plateau, to what is now Arches National Park, you still have the same formations. And Arches basically has the, some of the same formations that you see at Zion. It doesn't have the higher formations you see at Bryce. What's beneath all of those formations at the very bottom, at the same place where at the Grand Canyon you have the igneous and the, and the uh, uh, metamorphic rock, at Arches National Park, what you have is a bed of salt. And it's a bed of salt that is about, on average, 5,000 feet thick. It is layered salt. Geologists are familiar with this. This happens, this kind of layering happens when a body of sea water, of salt water, evaporates over time. In fact, geologists believe that this particular body of salt water must have evaporated completely and then been covered again and then evaporated and then covered again, a total of 29 times. I don't know exactly how they worked that out, but I do know that 5,000 feet, almost a mile of salt, solid salt, vertical mile, that's a lot of salt. It takes a lot of salt water evaporating to produce that kind of salt. That's at the bottom, underneath all of these other strata that we've talked about. So at one part of the uh, plateau you have rock, at another part you have this deep, deep well of salt, almost a mile thick. Well, that's not the end of the story. What apparently has happened is that the entire plateau has been lifted. These rocks, geologists believe, could not have been deposited as they were at their per current elevation. It, the, the, the plateau is actually very, very high right now. They believe that the entire plateau has been lifted about a mile in the air. How did that happen? For this, I don't believe that there's any completely agreed upon explanation. I believe that the current theory is something like this. At one point, the Pacific tectonic plate was subducting under the North American plate. Uh, oceanic plates are heavier than continental plates. And so this Pacific plate was moving this direction and it went underneath the North American plate, that is it subducted. But it subducted, they believe, at a very shallow angle with the result that it actually pressed up the land. And therefore this Colorado plateau was lifted up about a mile and that's a process that takes a long period of time. That doesn't happen overnight. And then, after that happened, erosion began to be at work. And 
these various strata of rock began to disappear. So that at Zion, we no longer see the strata that we see at Bryce. They used to be there, but they're no longer there. They've eroded away. At the Grand Canyon, we no longer see the strata that we see at either Zion or Bryce because they've all eroded away. And then the Colorado River has cut down into the remaining strata and given us the Grand Canyon. Well, mainstream geology looks at this and says what we have here is a set of processes that obviously took extremely long periods of time you, to, to form even just that body of salt that is down at the bottom of that, that pile takes a very, very long period of time. That doesn't happen quickly. Then the de deposition of all of these different layers, there had to have been times when the climate changed entirely so that instead of having water being w w depositing s a sandstone, you had wind producing sand dunes, then a change of climate again and water covering this area again, and then another change of climate with sand dunes again. And then the whole thing has to be lifted by this slow tectonic process. And then erosion, which is a slow process, has to wear away until we see what we have here. This is the kind of evidence that persuaded the early geologists in Europe that, the, that we we're looking at great ages of the Earth. They didn't know how long, but they simply could not see how this kind of a column of ge geological formations could have been formed within a few thousand years, let alone in a one-year worldwide flood. There simply doesn't appear to be any way that you can get this clear stratification and different types of rocks uh, and salt beds. And in other places in the world, of course, there are deep beds uh, or deep reservoirs of oil or of coal. There are places, uh, for example, in Texas where you drill down for oil and you have to go down through corals, corals that used to ring a sea. The coral is in some places a thousand feet thick or more. Sometimes these corals ring other great deposits of, um, of salt. In one case, geologists can see layers or varves in the salt that they interpret to mean that this sea was evaporating for at least 200,000 years. Uh, this is, of course, on top of layers of sedimentary rock. And then on top of all of this, there are layers of sedimentary rock. Uh, if you live in Michigan, you're living on about a couple of miles worth of sedimentary rock, which is known mostly through drilling. If you go to the delta of a big river like the Mississippi and drill down into the delta, you can drill down sometimes as far as seven miles before you get to the very bottom of all the sediment that has accumulated from these rivers. Sediment accumulates not that fast. Even if you assume that in the past it accumulated more rapidly, seven miles is a lot of sediment. And all around the world, you have this kind of phenomenon of a very complex geological column. And geologists, believe that this is a clear sign of great age. Now you add to this the fossils. What the early geologists found and what later geology has confirmed is that there are a lot of fossils in sedimentary rock and the fossils are clearly stratified. That is to say, they're not all jumbled up as you might expect if there'd been a great flood and elephants and brontosauruses and trilobites had all died together. You might expect them to be buried together. No, you don't find that at all. You find the same types of fossils at the same strata and you don't find other ones there. You have to go to higher strata and the order is always the same. And it's the same around the world. It's possible for geologists, even if they don't have some absolute way of dating rock strata, to get a sense of the relative dating of the rocks simply by the type of organisms that were uh, fossilized in the strata. There's a very, very clear stratification of the fossils. Very hard to explain unless these are fossils of creatures that lived at different times in Earth's history. If they all lived at the same time and they all died at the same time, you would expect some mixing of the fossils. You do not find that. You do not find trilobites and human remains. You do not find elephants in Precambrian rocks. You find that there's a clear stratification of the fossils. All right, this is the basic evidence from sedimentary rocks. There's a lot more to it than that. There are many, many other examples that could be given, perhaps better examples than I'm able to give. I encourage you to read more, but I think this gives you a sense of where geologists began to, to recognize or began to believe that the Earth has to be very old. They simply cannot, even to this day, see simple ways in which this kind of a geological column and this kind of stratification of not only 
rocks, but also of, of fossils, could be produced apart from the assumption of very, very long periods of time. All right, we'll come back next time with more geological evidence. Thanks for watching.